And of course, the US must always placate the world's greatest polluter, namely its own Department of Defense, whose 700 bases are devouring 320,000 barrels of oil per day, more than is consumed by 200 countries. With its petroleum, its uranium, its lead and its mercury, the department uses the planet as its chemical toilet. Though the Pentagon's exempted from environmental rules, since it simply judges that such matters are beneath it. Thus, the US war on terror is fought with a toxic eco-terrorism to which no one in the White House ever says boo. For the Pentagon's priorities takes precedence over the whole system, and the US president hands it $2 billion a day. We are spending hundreds of billions of dollars, said Joseph Stiglitz, the Nobel economist, for weapons that don't work, on enemies that don't exist, and to me, that is a waste of money. At the outset of the US experiment, its luminary Tom Paine announced, we have it in our power to begin the world over again. An army of principles penetrates where an army of soldiers does not. But all he'd hear now would be a travesty of his ideals. Obama's supporters would claim their hero took a principled stand against the Iraq war by calling it dumb in 2002. Yet on entering the Senate in 2004, he'd vote for more war funding and he'd sign bills that furthered Iraq's destruction. Likewise, Obama would say in Jacksonville in 2008, I intend to keep in place the moratorium that prevents oil companies here in Florida from drilling off Florida's coasts and said it would have long-term consequences for our coastlines but no short-term benefits since offshore drilling would take at least 10 years to get any oil. Here, surely, was the environmentalist's candidate. But then, as president at the Andrews Air Force Base in May 2010, in order to sustain economic growth, Obama announced suddenly he approved drilling off Florida's coast. It meant he'd go further than Bush had done. BP and all the oil companies who'd contributed to Obama's election were delighted at their getting a waiver from the White House. Inconvenient needs for environmental impact studies were set aside to put BP entirely in control of how it conducted its drilling. Thanks to Obama's about turn, oil rigs and pipes could now be plunged into the Atlantic seabed from Delaware to Virginia. The president sided with those burying beaches from Mexico to Alaska and with those risking an Exxon Valdez or a Torrey Canyon. It's like a kick in the face, said Jonathan Ruiz of Florida International University to open the East Coast to offshore drillers, adding ruefully, I campaigned for Obama for 14 months. Graham Penniman of the University of Central Florida said, I was born near Florida's Emerald Gulf Coast. The memories I have on those beaches brings me so much joy that every night I fall asleep thinking about the moon's reflection across the water. Then he said, To imagine my beach any other way destroys my heart. Someone nicknamed Jawbone cruelly asked, has Obama met a big corporate group he doesn't fluff and kowtow to? Brendan Cummings of the Center for Biological Diversity said, short of sending Sarah Palin back to Alaska to club polar bear cubs to death, the Obama administration couldn't plan the bear's extinction more efficiently. The CO2 levels will doubtless rise and seashores turn to tar pits in order to please the oil moguls, snapping their fingers at politicians and pulling their strings till they're chanting in unison, drill, baby, drill. They're meant to be solving climate change, not causing it, said Anna Keenan of Climate Justice. To shore up the dollar, they'll contaminate their own shores, springing another leak in White House integrity. For capitalism insists, every president overlooks the Cree proverb. Only when the last river has been poisoned and the last fish caught will we realize we cannot eat money and be attentive when it's payback time for their backers. 
But if Walt Whitman had his wish to return and live with the animals, to stand and look at them long and long, because not one is demented with the mania of owning things, he'd see animals killed by mania, whales drinking oil slick. In the Gulf of Mexico, the sea and its bedrock are incessantly raided and assaulted by multinational corporations, keen to service carcinogenic colonies of mechanized human termites, whose oil thirst is insatiable and fundamentalist. Thus, they'd let the Gulf's clear, blue, sparkling seas burgeoning with life be clouded over by venal vandals with tunnel vision, who'd ignorantly overlook the fact that oil and water can never mix, allowing an underwater Eden to be turned into an abattoir. The definition of insanity is doing the same thing over and over and expecting different results, as Ben Franklin noted. So oil dealers, addicted to the American dream, sink hollow needles into nature's veins, then get angry when they run dry or burst. The Oceana Foundation had called Obama's offshore drilling a wholesale assault on the seas, and soon after his vault, Farche, an oil rig called Deepwater Horizon explodes and sinks and takes 11 lives. Directly following White House deregulation, millions of gallons spill out daily in long plumes for three months. Plankton and dolphins die in hypoxic zones where nothing can live, where marsh grasses wither and other life forms follow. Fiddler crabs are no longer tilling the coast's salt marshes to oxygenate their vegetation's roots. The beaches are oiled and re-oiled, then useless dispersants become as toxic as what they're cleaning. Sea turtles are burned to hide militant consumerism's crimes. Cetaceans' blowholes are plugged with slime. Coastal wetlands are clogged. Birds' wings become leaden. And fish, dead in the nets, smell of asphalt. Shorebirds and migratory birds from the Gulf of Mexico the brown pelicans, the egrets, the laughing gulls are grounded and their paralysed plumage stops them fishing, making them incapable of rearing spring nestlings. Manta rays and tuna flee changes in the sea's chemistry along with the zooplankton and phytoplankton, all those tiny sustaining life forms, the hinges of the universe that keep the world's living food store alive. The brain corals bioluminescence glowing deep in the ocean fades to darkness and is then extinguished. Waving fronds of sea anemones are rendered stationary as the ancient soup of life becomes inedible. Delicate shrimps, filter-feeding and underwater coral gardens are enveloped by surges of sludge and, due to biomagnification, poisons pass up the food chain, increasing their toxicity in the process. The Gulf's domino whale sharks open their mouths to filter plankton so the oil contaminates their gills. Then they suffocate, thanks to the largest oil spill in history, covering 75,000 square miles. But while crude oil's hydrocarbons can also poison the liver of all living things within reach in the ocean, the Gulf's 126 million gallon oil spill is upstaged by larger ones spilling into the sky. For the Gulf catastrophe's equivalent weight in hydrocarbons pours into the U.S. air every ten days. Due to consumerism's bad breath, its exhalations of burnt oil, beating hearts will be fatally stalled. All of it happening so the self-indulgent are spared a walk to the mall. All so the needs of a military machine are met by a man presented by his PR as a peace-loving philosopher king, but who now leaves trails of oil slick and tides of blood 